Exactly four years after leaving office, President Reagan was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by then-President George H.W. Bush. As always, President Reagan was hopeful for America's future. Some may try and tell us that this is the end of an era, but what they overlook is that in America, every day is a new beginning, and every sunset is merely the latest milestone for a voyage that never ends. For this is the land that has never become, but is always in the act of becoming. Emerson was right. America is the land of tomorrow. Thank you for joining us for this week's Throwback Thursday with President Reagan. Join us next week as we share another inspirational quote. It was an honor to do the flyover, both for uh, representing the health workers and then also for the Reagan National Library. It was just a fantastic day overall. Started off as a joint effort in New York and worked our way down the East Coast and then kind of hit the middle part of America. And then, as I said, we decided to hit a couple towns over on the on the West Coast, and that put an end to America Strong. But it was absolutely a national effort. It, it was ambitious, but at the end of the day, I think it was definitely worth it just to uh, honor the people who are on the front lines battling the outbreak and try to just improve their day a little bit if we can. Let them know that we're all behind you, we're supporting you, we're in this together, and we're thinking about you. And that was the intent of America Strong, and I think we were able to to do that effectively. All the flyovers that took place prior to that, San Diego and Los Angeles, were the six ship Delta formation. Uh, the six ship uh, Delta formation are the six show jets that fly the air show. Rick told me, he says, and once we get up just before Point Magoo, I'm going to join them up with the Delta, put them on the outside wings, and we're going to fly across the library in the Super Delta, which is all eight jets. And that is really very unique that uh, the the um, the Reagan Library got that fly over so. Yeah, it's really some unconventional heroes, I would call it, have emerged from this whole situation. Uh, you know, in tr traditionally in lanes, you wouldn't expect to find, you know, that kind of that kind of categorization. But, uh, you know, the, the people who check you out at the grocery store, the cashiers, uh, the, the people running the logistics train, truck drivers, people who receive shipments, these folks are on the forefront of this battle and every single day they're, you know, they're scrubbing up, they're going to work, they're protecting us, they're providing us essential goods and services. Uh, and these are scary times and they do it every single day. And it's it's not just, you know, it's it's not just because it's their job, it's their living, it's because they have a commitment to the American people. And I think to helping us get through this. And that is, that's a part of what America Strong was all about, just saying we are a strong nation because we have strong communities, we have strong people, and together we're gonna get through this. And that was kind of the, the whole go that we want to highlight there is that everybody's doing their part and we appreciate that.
Let us begin an era of national renewal. Let us renew our determination, our courage, and our strength. And let us renew our faith and our hope. We have every right to dream heroic dreams. Ronald Reagan's election victory marked a profound change in American politics. Carrying 44 of 50 states, he attracted votes from many Democrats and independents. He led Republicans to control of the U.S. Senate for the first time in 28 years. The Democrats still controlled the House of Representatives and would challenge many of his ideas throughout his presidency. The election of 1980 marked the beginning of the Reagan Revolution, based on freedom, economic opportunity, national pride, and global democracy. On January 20th, 1981, as he took the inaugural oath, Ronald Reagan wore this suit, and Mrs. Reagan wore this wool ensemble designed by Adolfo. Both are on display within the Reagan Library galleries. Thank you for joining us for this week's Monday Minute in the Archives. Join us next week as we share our next treasure. Director Pompeo, uh, welcome to the Reagan Library. It's just an honor to have you here. Thanks so much for coming. John, it's great to be here. Thanks for including me. Um, you know, Director, I, uh, I've read that you are uh, close to the president. Uh, that's a great thing. Um, obviously, it means he, he carries, he has a lot of trust in you. Um, and yet, I sometimes hear in the press, oh, well, that makes the director political if he's too close to the president. And I wonder, how is that conceivably possible, possibly a, a negative when uh, the president listens to you and you're there on a daily basis giving him intelligence? You know, my, my task every day, I get a chance to be with the president uh, with great frequency to deliver this incredibly important information, this data set, so that he can inf make informed policy decisions. Uh, the, the fact that I have that opportunity is quite incredible. It hasn't been that case with lots of presidents. This one has uh, not only permitted but demanded it. He wants to know the he wants to know the truth and asks hard questions of us. Ensures that we're delivering that to him, not just the CIA but the entire intelligence community. And so, from my perspective, it has been uh, a great benefit to American national security that we're able to give the president this information in a way that he can contextualize and understand it and then help the broader policy community get to the right place so the president can make the best decisions for America and the world. I have to think, uh, you know, oftentimes uh, people analyze the morale of the, the department, the agency, and, you know, many people work there their whole lives, and there's intelligence professionals that dedicate their lives to it, and so morale is always a big issue. I have to think that the morale has to be pretty good at an agency right now uh, that has the ear of the president, as you say. I think that's true, but I think just as important from a morale perspective, this is an agency that was built on mission, that has always been focused on just getting stuff done. And this president has permitted us to do that. Um, he, he is demanding. He demands the intelligence community execute uh, the mission, the national security mission. He's told us what his priorities are, and then he has empowered me, and in turn I have allowed the agency to go out and crush it, to give unfair advantage to the United States of America. And so uh, I always think morale is best at the CIA when <laughs> these officers who have volunteered to come to the clandestine service to be part of the world's finest espionage organization are unleashed to, to do their job. And, and that is certainly the case today. Uh, my expectations for my workforce are incredibly high, and I think that's something that, uh, that they thrive on. 
knowing what you know now about the challenges and the threats and the work you're putting in each day to, to address them, where do you think um, you hope to pin your greatest success? Is it, is it going to be on the defeat of ISIS? Uh, you know, you, do you think you'll be able to look back and say, we stopped North Korea? Is there something in particular from an intelligence perspective in particular where you'd say, okay, that's where we deserve the trophy? I don't know exactly where it'll be. I hope we achieve success for the president and the country on each of the, in each of those theaters and against each of those adversaries. Um, as the director, one of the things that I'm counting on is that I will leave behind an organization equipped to continue to conduct espionage for the next 20 years. A workforce that is fired up and with leaders capable of executing the mission. Technology in a place where we are cutting edge, uh, best in class along multiple dimensions. Uh, and an understanding of our place in the world that is consistent with the tradition now 70 years on at the CIA. If I can do that, if I can leave for the director after me or the one after him or her, uh, then I'll feel really good about what I did during my time on duty. Terrific. Mr. Uh, Mr. Pompeo, Director Pompeo, it's just an honor to have you here. Thank you so Thank much you, for sir. answering the questions. Thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you Congressman Will Hurd, who represents Texas's 23rd Congressional District. Before being elected in 2014, Congressman Hurd worked to stop terrorists, prevent Russian spies from stealing our secrets, and put nuclear weapons proliferators out of business as an undercover officer serving in the Central Intelligence Agency. This program is also part of the Reaganism podcast series, which is dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. The show is hosted by the Washington, D.C. director of the Ronald Reagan Institute, Roger Zakheim. Roger and Representative Hur discuss the congressman's time in the CIA, lessons he has learned from winning close elections in a politically split district, and his perspective on law enforcement reform as the lone black Republican in the U.S. House of Representatives. If you enjoy the conversation, please subscribe to Reaganism on YouTube, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts, and remember to write us a review. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Congressman Will Hurd, welcome to the Reaganism podcast. Great to have you here. Hey, brother, it's, it's good to be on. I don't know why it's taking so long for you to have me on, but hey, uh, we, we did it. You know, we're just getting started here. We had to work our way for the cream of the crop, you know? Um, and you've got so much going on and uh, uh, leading voice in the, in the Congress uh, on so many issues. You and I got to know each other working on national security issues. Mm -hmm but it's, that's only one place uh, where you have uh, such an important voice in the U.S. Congress. We'll talk about all that, but for our listeners, uh, you know, give us a little bit about your background. Um, there's uh, a quote that uh, my colleague Keegan Sweeney found in a profile written about you when you made the decision to leave the CIA to run for Congress. Uh, it's not a quote from you, it's from your brother. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This is great. It reminded me of something my brother might said, uh, on this decision, he said, uh, referring to you, Congressman Will Hurd, you could have done anything, done anything you wanted, but he went from dealing from one set of terrorists and thieves to dealing with another set of terrorists and thieves. Sounds like your family supported this decision. 
<laughs> yeah, it looked. Hey, um, this this is a long long uh, history of me making decisions my my family didn't support. When when I first decided to get into the CIA, um, you know, I was right out of undergrad, and 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 to get to that point, right? To get to that point, my degree was computer science, and I thought I was going to be a programmer somewhere, and um, I had never been outside of Texas. Asterix. Um, I had been to Langston, Oklahoma, which is basically like Texas. Isn't that part of Texas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and um, I had I had been to Indiana as a young boy. I don't remember it. And and I went and toured Stanford's campus when I was in college because I was going to go there. Um, and I'd never left campus. So so anyway, so I'm walking across. It's my freshman year at Texas A&M University. I see a sign that says "Take two journalism classes in Mexico City." for $425. And I had 450 bucks in my bank account. So I go to Mexico, right? Fell in love being in another culture, reading about things I'd only read about in books. Like, you know, I went to like the, the, the pyramid of the sun, right? And you're like, holy mackerel, this is amazing. But you're like, wait a minute. This isn't the Aztecs built this? We don't know who built the pyramid of the sun. We don't know what those people called it. Like, the Aztecs found the Pyramid of the Sun a thousand years after it was built. Like, like, like this stuff just blew my mind. And so I added international studies as a minor. Mm. In the first class I took, I had this old school guest lecturer, cold warrior, CIA tough guy. Right? His name is Jim Olson. And, and he was the head of counterintelligence, um, was involved in the Aldrich Ames, you know, uh, capture, all that stuff. And he told these stories and I was like hooked, right? And that began my interest in CIA. And so long-winded set up to this point of the story, I tell my father, my father and my mother knew I was going to CIA and I had also gotten a job, an offer from IBM. And my, my offer from IBM was three times <laughs> the salary I was gonna be making as a GS7 step five in government. Oh, and my dad was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my dad was horrified of my decision. And he's like, he's like, boy, I don't want to come home one day and my house blow up. Right. And I'm like, if that's if that's your biggest concern, Pops, we're, we're going to be OK. So so I've been I've been, um, you know, uh, not living up to my my family's expectations for for a long time. So you go from the CIA turning down IBM and then you migrate from the CIA to the US Congress, another uh, unconventional or unusual <laughs> step. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're an agent working in Pakistan, not disclosing anything that hasn't been disclosed publicly already. Sure. Uh, and then you find yourself on the floor of the US Congress. What did you see in, I don't know, it was Islamabad or some other spot yeah. that you said, I gotta come back and, <laughs> and leave uh, the Congress? Look, so, so, I was what's called, uh, uh, old school guys called a case officer. The technical term is operations officer. So I was the guy responsible for collecting intelligence. I was the guy recruiting spies and selling secrets. And because I came straight out of undergraduate, and we only take a really small group of people that do that, um, I was in DC and in, in training a little bit longer than, than the clandestine service trainees, the CSTs, right? And so um, I, I, I started, literally I drove my, my forerunner from San Antonio to Washington, D.C., the day of the USS Cole bombing, right? Um, mm -hmm. The USS Cole, the, 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 the U.S. naval destroyer in the Gulf of Aden off, off the coast of Yemen. Um, and I remember this was back in the day when, when you were pumping gas and there'd be like a little TV there. And I remember pumping gas and seeing this. And I'm like, whoa, I'm getting ready to join the CIA. I wonder if I'm going to know anything about this. Fast forward like three weeks. Oh, did you? <laughs> I'm on the freaking Yemen account, right? I'm like, I'm like, literally fresh off the boat, you know, dealing with uh, dealing treatment. with Yemen. Yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. I, I went to Aid. I went, to, I went to Sanaa. I went to the capital of Yemen. I didn't go to Aid. Um, and so it was a great job. And so, in addition to collecting intelligence and being in dark places and dangerous places at four o'clock in the morning. Um, I also had to brief members of Congress, right? And, and I was pretty shocked by the caliber of some of our elected leaders. These are the congressional and, delegations coming in and uh, overseas you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, the hipsy codels. You, you know this, Roger, right? Like, like you know, it, it is, these are, these, are, these are members of Congress 
most of the times that are serving on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence or appropriations, sometimes appropriators would, would be allowed, and, and you would have to brief them for a number of issues. And, and you know, I, I tell a story about what happened when I was in, in Afghanistan, but a, a story I haven't told that often was when I was in India. And, and you ha this was after the tsunami in, in 2000, this would have been 2004, mm -hmm. 2004, 2005. And, and that tsunami literally killed hundreds of thousands of people in South Asia. There was a, there was a bipartisan, bicameral group of members of Congress come over and they were getting ready to, to give a brief, they were getting ready to do a, a, you know, with our colleague, the congressional colleagues from the Indian parliament. And it was a briefing right before they were going to go out. And a member of Congress raises his or her hand and says, I don't know what all the hubbub is about, uses the word hubbub, because I thought based on their religion that when they die this way, they come back as a tree or a flower, and that's what they want. And you're like, hmm okay, you're not allowed to speak at the, at the podium, right? And then, then you fast forward to like Afghanistan, bomb goes off in front of the embassy, takes out a section of our, of our protection, protective wall, kills some of the local guards. My unit was responsible for figuring out what happened. We conduct a couple dozen operations. We had a Hipsy Codel that night, congressional delegation. And I'm walking in the briefing and the first thing somebody says is, is the CIA gonna cut this briefing short? so we can get to the bazaar to buy rugs, right? I'm annoyed, right? But whatever, we go in the briefing and a senior person who had been on the committee for five years says, ask the question, this is 2008, why was the, um, why was Iran not supporting the Taliban in Afghanistan the way Iran was supporting other groups in Iraq? Okay, and, and for those of y'all listening, Roger just made a weird face because this, this is actually a pretty basic question that you would expect. You would not expect someone who'd been on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence for five years to ask. So I started explaining the Sunni Shia divide. And the same member says, Will, what's the difference between a Sunni and a Shia? And I'm thinking he's getting ready to make a really inappropriate joke. And who am I to deny this member of Congress the opportunity to make a joke? And so my response was, I don't know, Congressman, what's the difference? And, and I'm getting ready to go, but I'm bump bump, right? His face goes right away. I didn't know that, that difference in Islam, right? It's okay for my brother not to know that because he's, he's a salesman in San Antonio. But for someone who's making those decisions on sending our boys and girls and men and women into tough places or how to spend billions of dollars, it's unacceptable. And so that's why, and that's along with the story, I apologize for the no, long, long that's, telling, that's Roger, but, great but that's why I decided to run for Congress. And so yeah. I left a job I loved after nine and a half years, moved back to my hometown of San Antonio, ran for Congress, and then lost a runoff by 700 votes. So, so I'm glad I don't tell that, that story anymore. Yeah, so, well, I mean, so you don't make things easy for yourself because you, you go from literally the hot spots in the world, our greatest national security challenges, and then you pick a district that basically requires 24 hours a day, 365 days a year attention. Um, I mean, your races are decided by less than a thousand votes. Give us a sense of the district and um, partisanship uh, mm -hmm. and Texas and what it just says about the challenge you face running for office, but also the country writ large. So the 23rd Congressional District of Texas is 29 counties, two time zones, 820 miles of the border. It takes 10 and a half hours to drive from one corner of the district to the other at 80 miles an hour, which is actually the speed limit in, in a lot of the districts. It is, since 2016, has flipped back and forth, RD, RD, RD. I'm the first to hold it three cycles in a row. And it's a 71% uh, Latino district. And so every issue imaginable is, is in the 23rd. And, and to be frank, I ran, in, I ran in, in 2009 for the 2010 election. One of the reasons, one, this is basically where I grew up, but it was a district that um, a, a dark horse candidate like me could win if you 
spend time, energy, and effort and put energy into it. And you know, I tell people a third of my district doesn't have cell phone service. And, and sometimes there's more cows than people in, in the middle part of the district. And so, but uh, it, it's, 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 it's it, I wish more districts across the country were like mine. That's where it's truly 50 50. And, you know, the, well, oh, the why reason. Is thing? Why do you wish that? The only way in our country we've been able to solve problems is by doing it together, right? This concept that unified government that really over the last 10 or 15 years, that the only way to govern is unified government, meaning the same political party in the White House, Senate, and the House, right? That has not been the case over the, the, the history of our country. And we usually are able to govern and, and work together, right? And when you work together, those things stick, right? You know, the major piece of legislation that have been bipartisan has stuck. And, and that's what's great. And so to me, the competition of ideas should happen in November, not in March for in Texas's case, which is when our primary is, right? Primary dates are different across the country. And so if more districts were 50-50 and that competition of ideas was in November, we would be better off. And, and if you look at the 2020 cycle, 40 seats are competitive. But if you go back 20 years, you probably had about 100 and you know, almost about 100 seats. 10 years before that, about 150. 10 years before that, you know, over 175, right? And, and so if more districts were 50-50, I think you would see, you, and I get rewarded for solving problems. And, and right, the way you win elections now is by creating contrast. And so if I win an election by creating contrast, guess what am I always doing? Creating contrast, right? And, and so I, I think that, and, and that's, why, that's why I love the 23rd, right? The 23rd is not like that, it's the exact opposite. So uh, we're gonna get to this at the end, but one more question on this point, and then I wanna, I wanna talk about your, your role in the Republican Congress right now, the Republican conference is to say, but, um, is it alienating to be a member who has to really kind of be in a 50 50 district? And, you know, as you said, you're trying to get stuff done. You know, you didn't use the word compromise, but I think it's what you're implying that you got to compromise. You got to seek some sort of agreement and consensus. Whereas the other uh, members, either members in your own party, members in another party, where it's not 50 50, there they're using the institution as a platform, like what you've all you know, written about. And they're not trying to get stuff done. I mean, how do you how do you coexist with the members who are in the 50-50 space and those that are in an 80-20 district? It's, it's so this is why there's a lot of friction, right, in getting things done. And and so look for me, it's real simple. My, my philosophy is this: the president of the United States is not my boss. The speaker of the house is not my boss. The leader of my party is not my boss. My bosses are the 800,000 people that I represent, right? And, and, and I, I've been given, I've been empowered by them to come solve problems, come to Washington, D.C. to solve problems for them. And so, so for me, I agree with people when I agree with them. I disagree with them. I disagree with them. And, and it's, it's unfortunate that phrase, that word compromise um, has almost become a four-letter word. And, and part of it is the way we negotiate in Washington, D.C., in my opinion, is backwards. It, you know, we, I say we, we negotiate through subtraction rather than addition. What do I mean by that? One side will say, I want these 100 things. And the other side says, no. And so you whittle it down to like 12 things. And then you're like, what happened to the other 78 things, right? And you felt like you left so much on the table instead of starting with, hey, I want this one thing. Okay, the equivalent of that one thing are three things on my side. Well, I don't think that's the case. Let me add two more. And so when you build up to the 12, then it becomes a win-win and it's a victory, right? And so, so that's how when I was in the private sector, you would negotiate contracts and, and, and unfortunately, in, in Washington, D.C. right now, it's everybody wants to beat their chest. And, and the old notion, you know, I, I, when I first came involved in politics, I was told good policy is good politics. That may not always ring true uh, right now 
in, in this in this time. So uh, we'll get back to this in a bit, but you know we're obviously having this conversation amidst the pandemic, amidst mm -hmm. protests across the country uh, with the killing of George Floyd, um, and really uh, important discussions around race in this country. Um, you are the only black Republican in the House of Representatives. Uh, you have an important and unique voice. Uh, and you know, fortunately uh, for all of us, you've given us opportunity to hear you of late. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna talk about that and specifically just being in a Republican conference as the only black Republican. You know, tell us what that's like and mm -hmm. why is it that way? Uh why is it that way? Look, it's it's a it's a really good. I, I I wish I wish I was a proper historian and and could and could 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 say why. Right? When you go back to, we all know. You know, uh, my father always says, my father's eighty seven year old black man. My my mother is white. And my dad always says he's like I've been a Republican since Lincoln freed us. Right? And then you look at what Ulysses S. Grant, who is completely underrated as a president, the things that he's done for for our country and the African American community. And when you look at um, you know some of the the Jim Crow laws and things that happened, those were actually uh, democratic laws uh, uh, back then. How we have gotten to this point, I, I wish I could do better. Say why we are where we are today. But one of the problems that we have is is and this is not me complaining this is just statement of fact when any republican says anything crazy every other republican has to answer to that and so there are republicans that have said racist misogynistic anti-semitic homophobic things right and and unfortunately the entire party gets 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 painted with that brush and then we don't do enough to take our message to communities of color. And, and, and so if we did a better job of engaging folks, and you can't engage, if you try to engage somebody three months before an election, that's called pandering, right? You have to have a prolonged effort. And so what I have done, like when, when I go to communities along the border, that literally in, in a primary, the first primary, there's a, uh, Eagle Pass is on the border, the county is Maverick County, in, in, in 2009 Republican primary, there were 27 Republican primary voters, wow. right? Uh, now, in the general election, you had, it was the fourth largest county, right? And, and so a lot of times Republicans just didn't go. Mm. But hell, I showed up, right? And, and literally, the first time I went, there was a party, it was an afternoon party, about 700 people. And I had 212 people come up to me and ask me, why was I there? Now, the, what I call the professional political class, campaign consultants and pollsters would say, you know, well, these are Latinos and they're probably Catholic and Catholics are pro-life. You should talk about your pro-life, you know, experiences. Like, no, 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 no. My answer was real simple. I'm here because I like to drink beer and eat barbecue too, right? And then, uh, and then they, they kind of laughed. And the second time I showed up, people would actually shake my hand. Third time I showed up, people would walk by and be like, I'm a Republican, right? And then the fourth time they'd tell me a problem, fifth time I'd come back and say, hey, this is how I solved it, right? And so my numbers in that community like were drastically improving. And one of the reasons why um, I've been able to survive and, and, and thrive, to be honest, in a district like this, because I engage. Now, I don't engage just because I have melanin in my skin. I engage because it's the right thing to do. And so at every level of government, we need more Republicans going into communities and engaging them. We need to be engaging you know, women with a college degree that live in the suburbs. We need to be talking to people under the age of 29. And we need to be talking about issues that they care about. And oftentimes we come in with some complicated macroeconomic theory, and it's like, no. People care about food on the table, roof over the head, and, and, and the people that they love being healthy and happy. Focus on those things, right? And this is where I, I criticize some of the think tanks and stuff too, because let's articulate how our policies in recent times has helped. We always just want to, you know, right now uh, under the current administration, you know, unemployment for African Americans is the lowest it's ever been. Okay, great. We need to be able to talk about more things, right? Uh, we, we should be talking more about 
how um, school choice in Texas has led to Latinos having better test scores by far, right? Uh, versus versus people in, in, in other schools, right? Like th there's there's data for that, and so we need to be taking a, a more nuanced message. Anyway, I'm I'm I'm, no, I'm babbling a little bit here about about it's this, not, but, but this is some of the issues. Yeah, no, it's getting to engagement. I mean, it, it's a very kind of applied set of examples of, of how you engage, and and I mean, you've said that if the Republican Party doesn't start looking like America, there won't be a Republican Party in America, and I think you know, that fairly provocative, yet, uh, you know, probably sound insight, uh, the way you, you, you address that is by, by engaging. Um, and of course, you know, one of the ways you're engaging right now um, is the response to George Floyd's uh, killing and, and, you know, the discussion, at least at the federal level, of, of law enforcement reform. You wrote uh, about 10 days ago or so, mm. um, a really, I thought, excellent and important opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal um, about George Floyd and about what you would be advocating in the Congress. Uh, but you started that by sharing personal experience and, and, and uh, one that uh, has come up a lot across the black community in terms of what it's like to be a young black man getting behind the wheel and how your father essentially trained you. Yeah. Look, my dad, my dad, when I, so, so I, I think I, in the piece I said I was 15, but I think I was 14 because in Texas, we're allowed to get our learners or we used to back then get our learners permit when we were 15. Right. And so I was always pushing the envelope and, and, and my dad said, if I ever get pulled over by the police, um, you know, turn your radio off, turn the light in the car on so everybody can see inside, roll your window down, put your hands on the window seal, and don't make a move unless you tell the police officer what you're going to do. Um, sir, if you need my license, it's in my, if it's in my, it's in the right pocket of my pants. I need to reach with my right hand to get to my right pocket. And then don't do that until the officer says, okay, right? And and it, it's, it's it, you know, if, if you talk to folks in the African-American community, especially men, you'd be like, you know, your dad had to talk. A lot of people talk about, you know, the talk being about the birds and the beads. A lot of times it's, it's how you deal with the police. And, and so what, what has happened, and what's been, I, I told that story because um, one of my staffers was, was like, oh, my God, I, 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 that's just, why did you have to do that? And, and I've had people respond to me telling this now, be like, well, I told the th same thing to my daughter. And my response to that is simple. You told that to your daughter because she was going to be upset that she was going to get in trouble. My dad told it to me because he thought it would save my life, right? And that's the, that's the, big, that's the big difference. And so what is unique about this point and where we are now, and, and I think why, why George Floyd is such an important part in our history. Nobody who saw that video thought that anything that happened in there was okay, right? And you had video and audio. And, and the fact that he called out to his mother who had already passed away, right? And, and you know, this made people like, whoa. And, and the, how cavalier that officer was, kneeling on his neck, with his hand in his pocket, right? People are stopping and being like, whoa, what is really going on? And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a, people are, are asking these questions. So that's why being able to talk about it a little bit more. Um, you know, even little things, right? Like if you ask, if you ask any black person, how many times has somebody ever asked to touch your hair? Hmm. It would be probably dozens if not hundreds, right? And, and it seems like, it's, it's like, I would never talk to a stranger or someone I didn't know and be like, can I touch your hair? Because it's so unique. Like, it's, it's little, these are little things, right? These are little, these are little things. And my, my parents, uh, my parents live in the home that they live in now, and they've lived there my entire life, 43 years, because nobody, no other place in town would uh, sell to an interracial couple. So my mom would go look at, at houses and my dad was a traveling salesman. So 
he was he was gone most of uh, you know Monday through Thursday or through Friday, and then my mom would see the house. Like, okay, my husband's coming home and and he, he wants to see it, and they would go on a Saturday, and the realtor would be like, oh, it's been sold, right? Now the place where we ended up living when they bought it, it was in the boonies. And the school that I ended up going to was a good, was a good public school. Because that was only like imagine. I mean, they were out in the boonies because that was a place that someone would sell, sell to them. They, was, they, was, they would sell to them, right? And so, so imagine this, right? At that time, the, 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 the places with the best school district, my parents couldn't move into. They had the money, they had the willingness, but they couldn't. So that deprived us act, potential access mm -hmm. to the best schools in those areas, right? And, and so these are the long-term ramifications. Well, now that's not happening now, right? But the ramifications of those previous decisions. And so I think these are some of the, the conversations that that people that people are, are having now. And, and what was interesting, uh, um, I marched in, in Houston um, to show solidarity with George Floyd's family, about 60,000 other um, folks from Texas. And it was peaceful. The police was handing out, was handing out water bottles to the, to, the, to the marchers. And you had all shapes and sizes, all colors, right? Like it really, I, I was shocked at how many non-blacks were there. No, right? I saw your tweet. You tweeted live from there or you put something out. It was, it yeah, was it, was, it was amazing. And, and, and for me, it was... What was happening at that moment, people were outraged by a black man dying by a white officer in police custody. They were glad law enforcement was there um, enabling our First Amendment rights. And they were outraged by criminals taking advantage of these protests and looting and rioting and killing officers after the protests. All three things going on at, at once. And, you, and that's okay. You can feel all of those emotions at the same time, and it's okay, right? And that's one of the things that I took away um, from that march, and, and, and hopefully, right, that feeling of, of being upset or concerned about all these things, this is not about, you know, it, look, the, the debate, you know, we support law enforcement. This, this notion of defunding the police is crazy because it's gonna lead to less safe communities. Nobody wants that, right? But we can make sure we have the best standards of police departments across the country. So you've, been, right? you've been talking about this a bit. I mean, so, you know, you go from that march, those mix of emotions articulated, you know, really well, just capturing that moment. And, but you are that member of Congress, right? You are the one black Republican in the House of Representatives uh, in, the, in the Republican conference. And now you're back in the nation's capital and there's, what are we gonna do about this? And for the federal level, it's about law enforcement reform. And so now, you know, 10 days, 15 days later, whatever it is, you're in the center of this debate and you've just yeah. articulated where you stand on a major fault line, this defund the police yeah. or what you've emphasized, training, spending more yeah. to train police. Uh, there are other things out there, uh, whether we should, if uh, Congress should prohibit use of chokeholds or no-knock warrants for uh, drug-related cases or, or this notion of qualified immunity. What are you emphasizing? And give us a little bit of uh, insight into this moment in legislative craft, yeah. uh, different factions, parties debating, negotiating, and whether it's politics as usual, or are you seeing something different? So both in the substance, but also the process sure. here, Will, and then, and then I know uh, we'll, we'll, we'll shift to another uh, part of the discussion before we close out. Sure. Um, so, so let's start with, if I, could do, if I could do two things. First is, you have groups like CALEA, the Commission for the Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies, that are police officers, these from all walks of life that talk about what is the best standard and how you teach de-escalation. What is the best standard in dealing with someone who has a mental health issue? What is the way you respond to somebody who's drunk, right? How you should handle people when they're handcuffed, right? Like, like we can come up with the best standards and how policing works, but unfortunately, 
that level of training is not uh, the same across police departments across this country. How can we incentivize police departments to use those best practices? And to me, it's with federal grants that, that are already being given, right? And so, so let's improve, dollars. yeah, let's improve, let's improve the standards across all those. Let's find that standard body, use it. That's what two, making it easier for a police chief to fire a bad cop. Period, end of story, right? And, and, and usually a police officer fires a cop, it goes through adjudication, and then 46% of the time that cop gets put back on the force, right? It's so crazy. Time, if they get fired, if they go through that adjudication process, which just from the way you've described it seems onerous and difficult, 46% of the time that same officer will find that way back onto the force. The same force that the chief of police thought it was necessary to fire that person for. It's crazy, okay? And guess what? Police chiefs, good cops, they know who the bad cops are. They don't wanna work with them. So I feel like it's our responsibility to help make sure those bad cops are taken away because the good cops don't have. Oh, and by the way, a lot of times their records are expunged after two years. So any previous grievances that they had are flushed from those records, right? Um, so, so, so those two things would be, would, would have, I think, would, would put us in a better position to prevent another black man from dying the way George Floyd died, right? So, so now how do we get there? We were able to pass three colossal pieces of legislation and get them signed into law dealing with COVID-19 pandemic because the negotiations began in a bicameral bipartisan fashion. Reforming policing did not happen that way. Democrats introduced their bill. They're going to, they've introduced it already. They have 220 co-sponsors, which means they don't have to take input from Republicans. Um, we're going to have, you don't, you, you don't need any Republican votes once you have 220 co-sponsors. That's your point. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so are we going to make it to where it's overwhelmingly bipartisan? And, 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 and having private conversations with everybody involved in that, there's a lot of agreement on things that we can do, right? And, and so, so I also think that the rhetoric around this has been um, tame compared to rhetoric around other pieces of legislation, but we'll see over the next two weeks. And, and I think in the House, um, this is gonna go to judiciary, um, when it comes out of judiciary, I think that will be the time in which uh, potential changes are made. I'm hopeful uh, where Republican amendments can get added or, or, or at least um, get, get votes on, on the floor that I think can make this a stronger bill. You have the president issuing his executive order, and then you have a Senate version. And whether in the next couple of weeks we can all uh, get on the same page and not let politics get in the way, and I usually, I, I try to have it, my dad always taught me to have a PMA, a positive mental attitude. Um, I'm trying to stay positive uh, because in the conversation I've had, there's a lot of overlap on how we can get there. So I, I want to jump to your future uh, and then we'll do our, our lightning round. But before we leave this subject, you know, just hearing you describe your activities the past couple of weeks and your deep and important thinking on this issue, do you feel that the Republican conference and more broadly, the Congress is giving you, uh, is taking your voice and taking your, your, your point of view into account adequately. Oh, for, for sure. For sure. There's, there's no doubt about that. And, and, and look, uh, uh, Kevin McCarthy, I consider him a friend and he's always, you know, wanted me to, to be more outspoken and, 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 and play his role. So, so look, I, and also here's the deal. Hey, I'm going to give my opinion, right? whether some folks like it or not. And I'm going to be honest and, and I'm going to always try to work towards a solution. And so, um, so yeah, I've, I've made my opinions known. And, and, that, and, and that, was always, that, that was always the case, but probably, um, you know, especially so now that um, you will not be seeking reelection. Mm -hmm. um, there will be a, a, a new member of Congress representing the 23rd district uh, a congressional district of Texas. Um, that was a blow. 
to 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 all of all of uh, your fan club, Will. Um, and I think anybody listening to this this conversation, you know, uh, will share that view. Uh, just take a few minutes. Explain to everybody uh, why now was the time to leave. Obviously, it's a it's a grueling lifestyle, particularly uh, to get reelected in your district. So that's that's understandable. Uh, you went from the CIA to the U.S. Congress. What's the next painful thing you plan to do with your life? <laughs> um, so, look, I, I appreciate the the kind words and. Just like I, I left the CIA because I thought I can help the intelligence community a different way, I feel like I can help the country a different way, right? I've always said that these jobs being in Congress are not designed to be in it for 30 years. Um, I think I'm at 16 pieces of legislation signed the law, 15 or 16, probably a couple more before it's over. That's more legislation than most people get signed the law over a 20, 30 year career. So legislatively, I'm pretty proud of, of my, my three terms in, in Congress. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, there was a in, a, in a book that I like about Ronald Reagan, I don't know if this is Ronald Reagan said it, or if, if this was the author of the book saying this about Ronald Reagan, it was like, listen, lead, and then leave, right? And, and so for me, the opportunity to do stuff in media to talk about the issues I care about, that interconnection of technology and national security, you know, is going to be exciting. And, and working on projects like a Anthony Bourdain style show on technology is going to be fun. Um, to be able to be in the private sector and work on the cutting edge of artificial intelligence. Um, Vladimir Putin said, whoever masters AI masters the world, right? And I don't agree with anything Vladimir Putin said, <laughs> except for probably that statement. And so there's no second place when it comes to AI. And having been involved in this on the legislative side and the policy side, to be able to help do this with the people that are designing these algorithms, like that's gonna be, that's gonna be exciting. Um, also working with in academia on building an institute on technology and policy. I wanna get that poli sci you know, major who gets a data sciences minor and then help them become and understand both sides of the policy and, and the technology so that we have those people in Washington, D.C. shaping the environment for us to make sure that we continue to have the strongest economy in the world. And then, and then politically, I'm staying involved. I'm helping candidates across the country um, you know, in, in difficult primaries um, to make sure that we have that Republican Party that looks like uh, America. So, so I'm looking forward to, to, to doing those things, staying involved. And, and working on these issues that I've cared about since in my time in Congress. But there's a possibility in the future you'll return to public office. You know, that the, the, it's a nice challenge <laughs> yeah. for you next, but you're not writing that off entirely, right? Like, I'm, I'm 42 years old, and, and if the sun, the rain, the, the moon, the stars, and the mountains align again, then, then yeah, I'll, I'll evaluate it. And, and if I have a chance to serve my country um, again that way, then, then of course, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. Um, but but there's, there's so many ways to serve, and, and I've, I've enjoyed my time in Congress. And guess what? I'm going to run through the tape um, in these final five or six months, however long it is. No doubt. Uh, we're going to go to our lightning round. Uh, this is where we ask you, our You've guests. emphasized lightning a few times, Roger. I, I, I'm a little verbose. <laughs> I'll, I'll, it's only because I'll I have, tight, man. I'll I have your tight. staff pinging me right now. Like, you're supposed to let them go 15 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, either your favorite book about President Reagan, your favorite speech by President Reagan, your favorite President Reagan quote, one, two, or all three. What do you got? Gotcha, okay. Favorite book. I'm curious if you know this one. Reagan's Comeback by Gilbert Garcia. I'm a fail. I gotta retire and <laughs> leave. I have never heard of it. <laughs> wow. Boom. Look, it's, it's a great book. It's written by, it's a reporter from San Antonio. And it's about the, the 1976 primary in Texas and how Reagan won that. And it goes through that, um, that process and what's fascinating, right? And, and, I, and I, I read this book in between my, when I lost in 2009 and, but before I won in 2014. And what's wild is a lot of those people that helped Ronald Reagan in 1976 were people that were helping me Come on. Um, in, in, in 2014, right? It's, 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 it's an amazing um, how they pulled that off, right? It's, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful book. Another good one is, is The Greatest Communicator 
by by Dick Worthlin, um, you know his longtime uh, political um, you know uh, uh, writer and aid, yeah, uh, strategist, right? And and one of my favorite things from that is persuade through reason and motivate through emotion, right? That that's great. Um, and a great speech is his 1980 acceptance speech at the Republican nomination for president. And and while he was there accepting the nominee uh, as a Republican, he was already talking about Democrats and painting a, a vision of what the future should be and that, that way more united us than divided us, right? That's, that's, a, that's something that I, I firmly believe in. And, and the quote I often use from Ronald Reagan is, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. And man is not free unless government is limited. Having lived overseas in places um, that didn't have freedoms, that didn't have rule of law, um, this is something that has resonated, resonated with me. You killed the lightning round. That was that was amazing. <laughs> no other guest has done that. I mean, there was there were two unique references uh, that I am disappointed to say I had not heard of, but we'll check out. And the 1976 primary is a great one. That that is mm. old, but people don't really know about President Reagan, but actually one of the most consequential things he did. Um, Congressman Will Hurd, it's been awesome having you on the Reaganism podcast. We look forward to having you back at some point in the future. Uh, in whatever amazing new uh, uh, activity you're, you're up to. So uh, really, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, brother, enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.